quick background. I don't want to assume you know certain things that you don't, but nor do I want to, to bore you with, with tedious rehashing of, of things you know. Um, so the focus of tonight's lecture or talk is this idea of the examined life. Most people have heard uh, you know, the, this quotation attributed to Socrates um, at his trial, as found in Plato's dialogue, The Apology. And Socrates quoted as saying, the unexamined life is not worth living. And, and so, you know, we start with this notion of the, the examined life, and we want to look at, talk about, think about, well, what is an examined life? Um, probably as many people are, as are in the room could come up with as many different um, immediate sort of takes on what that might, what that might entail. Um, my own uh, areas of research and specialization, uh, in fact, the, the, you know, my, the core of my dissertation has to do with these ideas and moreover, how the ancients themselves understood these ideas. Because um, as we all know, over time, ideas can change, uh, words get used in new and different ways and such. And, and so it's often um, well worth our time and effort to try to uncover sort of the original uh, meanings of terms and concepts. Um, I have a background in Greek, ancient Greek, Latin, and Biblical Hebrew are my languages. I don't speak them so much as read the text. Um, so, you know, that being there as well. So let's think about this idea of, of the examined life. If, if we, um, I'm assuming everyone knows, uh, you know, Socrates was a teacher, but he never had a classroom. He simply would walk around and engage people in dialogue and discussion, and in doing so, he developed a great following of, of students. One of his students was, Aris, uh, was excuse me, Plato. Plato is the one who, in fact, wrote down the things that are attributed to Socrates. Socrates never wrote a book. He never published anything. <laughs> and um, so Plato has all of his, his writings. And then, of course, Plato had his student, Aristotle. So Plato established the first academy, and then Aristotle had one as well. Um, Plato and Aristotle agree on a great many things, but on certain things they do disagree. Um, so, but some of their most central ideas are really what's important to what we're talking about. Um, so this idea of the examined life. According to the Nicomachean Ethics, which is the, the book most people have at least heard of in terms of Aristotle's writings, Aristotle says, if you just look around and you look at human beings, it, it, it's pretty easy to see that every single human being is attempting to achieve in the Greek, what's called eudaimonia, translated as happiness. He says that's, that's simply observable. Just watch people. It doesn't matter what they're doing. They either do that very activity because that activity makes them happy or they believe that that activity is a means by which they will achieve happiness. And here's where we want to be careful about what we mean by happiness. We don't mean just any old kind of silly, trivial happiness, you know, maybe that you get from reading, um, you know, a comic strip in the newspaper, okay? This kind of happiness, eudaimonia, is, is better thought of as a flourishing, a flourishing of the individual human psyche and soul. I often use the metaphor of a garden. Imagine you've done a lot of work and you're plant, you've planted a garden and you've attended to that garden. You go out and you look at it and all of the, the plants are diseased and the vines are withered, you would not say that that garden is flourishing, right? But we all know what it, what it is to behold a flourishing garden. This is the idea that Aristotle had in mind for our lives as human beings, that this is in fact what every single human being is trying to achieve. They're trying to achieve an existence that is a flourishing existence. And thus Aristotle says, if everyone is trying to achieve eudaimonia, then we've got to look at why are so many people not achieving it? Where are we going wrong? What is the errors that we, that we make? In what ways are we falling short of what we're tr striving for? And this is where he himself kind of gets into, you know, sort of the, 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 what you could think of as the core of his ethical theory. He's, a, he's, he's known as a virtue ethicist. There's an emphasis on virtue, arete in the Greek. Um, Again, because I, I'm so in love with language, but it, you know, we all know what the sin is. Sin is Greek, but the actual meaning of the term sin is to miss the mark, as if you were an archer. 
sin is a missing of the mark. And for Aristotle, people fail to achieve their flourishing for that very reason. They miss the mark. They, they fail to understand what it is they need to do to achieve a flourishing existence. Okay? And so Aristotle says, well, okay, we, we, we see this much is true. Let's, well, what is it that people do? What are they doing with their lives that, that cause them to fail? He says, he, he loves our threes. If you've read any Aristotle, he loves to break things down into th threes, such as his number. And so he says, well, it looks like there's three, basically three ways people try to achieve happiness. Life of pleasure, life of honor, and a life of contemplation. Now, he doesn't deny that pleasure is pleasure and we all enjoy it. That's why it's pleasure. In fact, it's very basic to us. We learn it from the time we're born. What pleasure is, the comfort of a, a blanket, the mother's breast, a familiar toy. Pleasure, the pleasure of sweetness on the tongue. Right, a soft pillow. So it's, there's nothing against pleasure. However, as he points out and explains in great detail, if you base your sense of well-being, your sense of flourishing and happiness, upon pleasure alone, you are doomed to failure. Because you have no control over things outside of you, and it could be that any one of those things that currently give you pleasure goes away. Okay? So pick whatever you like, whatever pleases you, your favorite television show, your, your favorite comforter. The, over time, these things go away. Right? And he thinks that most people pretty early on realize that, whether it's through their training at home or through their um, participation in society, that by the time we're usually entering about elementary school age, most human beings are aware that pleasure isn't the end, if you will. It's not all there is. Pleasure's great, but there's more. And I think in my own experience and people I talk to and, and existing in the world, most people do agree that yes, it was some point when they entered into community, usually in elementary school, that they began to realize, oh, there's this other thing that brings me a sense of satisfaction. There's this other thing that makes me feel like my life is well lived and my life is meaningful, and that's honor. And all we mean by honor is simply the recognition from others. Okay? So, Aristotle doesn't demean honor, but rather he says honor is that which is bestowed upon us from other people and no doubt is often well deserved and can bring pleasure in itself. And it can affirm us, it can spur us on, it can inspire us to continue what we do. It can actually have a great role to play in the um, paths that we pursue in our lives. You know, especially if our sense of honor is, is tied up in our own sense of having accomplished something well. Like say you, you endeavor, maybe you're a science person and you've endeavored to figure out something that's really important to a lot of human beings. There's a lot of honor in that. Again, Aristotle doesn't, he's not against honor, okay? But he says, if you base your happiness, your sense of flourishing and well-being upon the esteem afforded to you by other people, you once again set yourself up for failure. You have no control over other people. You have no control over how they perceive you. Any number of things could happen to alter other people's perception of you. Thus, he says, while honor is indeed good, it feels good, it's great, and it can feed in in a lot of positive ways, a life of honor is not the way to achieve ultimate flourishing. Okay? So that brings him to his last alternative, the life of contemplation. Now, I personally have worked on the, the term that we are using in the Greek that we translate as contemplation. Um, it's central to some ideas I develop in my work. But the term in the Greek is theorem. We get the word theory from it. Okay? Now, the life of contemplation for Aristotle it's not about locking yourself up in a tower. It, it's not about going off and you know, shunning society forever and, and you know, have your cabin in the woods. Um, it, 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 it's, not, it's not about that. What it is about, though, is how much time an individual human being spends quietly, alone, in silent receptivity. 
especially today. I feel like we're in this really interesting time to exist in human history. Um, all of the, th the technological advances and the, all of the things that have saturated our society and certainly in the lives of most people that I see here because most of you are even a little bit older than I am anyway. Um, solitude and quiet is becoming exceedingly rare in the lives of most human beings. And for Aristotle, if you do not consciously, willfully, purposely cultivate a life where you have that solitary, quiet receptivity, there is no possible way you can flourish. And so I think this is an extremely important idea. And this is where I spend a lot of time on my research is really looking at well, what does this really look like, a practical day to day? Like, what does this mean? What am I doing? You know, am, am I really contemplating? Um, well, I teach college, I teach at Green Mountain College, and obviously so most people I'm speaking to are anywhere from 18 to 24, and sometimes you get a non-traditional student who's older. Um, but I always, you know, when we talk about Aristotle and these ideas, and I, I put that forth and I say, you know, this isn't about, you know, beating yourself up or being hard on yourself, but this is an invitation to really engage in some serious, honest self-reflection. And, you know, I, and I say, take this semester as an opportunity. To, to really think about these ideas and ask yourself about yourself in relation to these ideas. And it's pretty amazing. Um, one, I, I always applaud their honesty, but it's pretty amazing how many of them very, you know, forthright will acknowledge they, they spend virtually no time in silence. You know, from the minute they wake up, the TV is on or the, you know, the iPhone or the iPad or the ticker tape or whatever, and it's all day long, constant, continuous input. Okay, where there is just stimulation, if you will. Now, for Aristotle, obviously living in a far different time, 2,500 years ago, it might have been a little easier to have this, this quiet, contemplative time. Um, it serves many purposes, though. It, it, it's not just about downtime. <laughs> it's not just about kicking back and relaxing with your, your favorite glass of wine. Okay, um, th there's a much deeper and from my point of view, in my work, powerful message wrapped up in his understanding of the role and purpose of contemplation in the human life, in the pursuit of happiness. And it's tied up, I think it's easiest to look at it from the term itself. The Greek word is eudaimonia. When you break the word down into its constituent parts, eu, good, daimonia, the daimones, spirit. That literally means a good spirit or a good God within. The term eudaimonia. And he actually believes that every human being is trying to achieve that. And if we pause for a minute, we can think about how our society really does have these ideas. I always call it our bumper sticker mentality. Think about it. You've probably seen the bumper sticker that says, happiness is an inside job. That's Aristotle. It's not about pleasure, which comes from outside, the things you can buy, you know, the things you can acquire, you know, friends or girlfriends and boyfriends and lovers and, and you know, baubles. It's not about those pleasures, the pleasures of, you know, a little too much wine or a really, really tasty giant chocolate cake. And nor is it about the esteem of other people. Everybody loves me, everyone thinks I'm great, I'm well respected. Those things are fine. Don't misunderstand him. He doesn't say there's anything wrong with those things. But he says there's no way that human flourishing, human happiness is predicated upon those things simply because those things are not within the individual's control. They are not within your power. What is within your own control and power is how much time you spend in quiet contemplation. And so presupposed in the thought of Aristotle, is the notion of the spiritual realm. And obviously through the history of philosophy, which is again one of my areas, like you have the enlightenment and, and then you have the uh, uh, sort of this industrialist revolution and, and we have this embrace of um, you know, science and, and atheism. And certainly there was an eschewing of, of spiritual pursuits to some degree in the modern world. Um, in philosophy itself, which is another place that I have a great interest in, looking at what happened in philosophy over, you know, throughout the ages, throughout 2,500 years, um, the way in which philosophy went from, as Plato put it, 
point of education and philosophy is to turn your soul, to change you in a fundamental way. And then by the time you get up to, you know, um, the mo you know, this part, you know, straight on modern era, it's all about sort of this mechanized understanding of existence and how we can do things faster and quicker and make more money and build buildings taller and how can I have more stuff and, 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 and it's just something got lost there. And so one of my own areas and my interests has to do with sort of reclaiming in the thought of the ancient philosophers this appeal and dependence on and presupposition of the spiritual realm. Now one thing you have to understand is in no way do you have to subscribe to a particular metaphysics? It isn't about, oh, well, you know, what, what is it? Is it? Is it Christian? Is it Jewish? Is it uh, uh, like the Tibetan Buddhists think it is? Is it Taoist? Is it, is it Hindu? You know, no, none of that. That's, that's, those are fine things, but that's not at all what he's driving at or what he's interested in. In fact, the thing he's speaking toward when he talks about the need for this contemplative existence is so individualized that he even says in certain places that there really aren't proper terms to use. Simply because while we can talk about it in this general way, each individual person's experience of their connection, if you will, with the divine, with the source, whatever you like to call it, Heidegger, who's another um, one of my uh, philosophers I specialize in, he just refers to it as being, with a capital B. All right? But the, it's so particularized in the sense that our individual connection has so much that is unique that, you know, to try to homogenize that it is an error, according to Aristotle. So, life of contemplation and this idea of, of, well, you know, what would that look like? Okay, okay, so we can have pleasure and we can have honor and we can pursue our individual projects and dreams and goals, but we're not going to flourish unless we are engaging in a life of contemplation. The word theorein in the Greek means to look upon or gaze at that which is apparent. And so that's interesting, I think. Because I think a lot of time when you talk to people about what, what goes on in philosophy or what is it to contemplate or, you know, what do you do, what is philosophy about, people often feel like it's um, a highly investigative activity. You know what I'm saying? Like you're, like it's work, like you're uncovering and you're discovering and you're um, doing experiments and you're trying to figure things out and solve problems, right? And that's not at all what the term contemplation actually means in the Greek. It means to simply gaze upon what is right in front of you. And so, in my own work in trying to, you know, flesh, flesh out what this idea of contemplation looks like for us, what it would look like in our lives, I um, focus on the thought of Heidegger. Now, Heidegger loved the ancients, and so that was his own area. He was a scholar in the ancient thought, and he, he himself could read Greek, etc., etc. And he has this brilliant distinction that he makes in his own philosophy. He says, uh, he has a great quote where he says, man believes that he is the master of thought and thinking. But the truth is that all too often he does not engage in thinking at all. He rather engages in strategizing and in attempts to control. And so this distinction that he makes, on a basic level, you can think of it as the difference between thought that is purely active versus thought that is receptive. And he calls it the difference between calculative thought and meditative thought. He says, calculative thought races from one prospect to another, always trying to figure out how best to achieve an end goal, never stopping and pausing to rein in all the meaning of being that there is. Meditative thought, on the other hand, is the means by which 
the human being can reconnect to that which it is inherently a part of. And so he spends a lot of time talking about this idea of cultivating receptivity in your spiritual life. I mean, no doubt, it's wonderful to study, and, and I'm, I've been in school my entire life. I love school. I'll always be in school, one way or another. And I love to study and learn and, and discover and uncover. Um, but I, in the last nine years especially, have really learned in a deep way, not just in a cognitive way, this difference between active, con you know, calculative thought versus a receptive meditative thinking. Um, as an example to you, just because if you're, if you're trying to sort this out on your own, any time that you've had this experience of, and I know a lot of people talk about this, you know how when you try to think of something and you can't think of it, a word, or you're like, oh, what is her name? And you know when you rack your brain and you're like, I can't think of that word, or you can't think of that, and you know how often when you've given up, then it comes? Okay, that, that, that kind of gets you a little handle on receptivity. It's, um, another good example is in specifically creation. Okay, and so that's why I don't know if it was in where, but I know as part of my talk, um, the description I wanted to emphasize the idea of how for Aristotle, the um, flourishing life has to involve creativity of some sort. Whether it is in the way you prepare your food and serve it, or the way you uh, lay out your gardens, or in the poems that you write, or the paintings that you paint, or the dances you do, or the songs that you write. Creativity is a crucial part of happiness for Aristotle, of flourishing. And moreover, there's an emphasis on this idea that real creativity is the result of a human being opening themselves in that receptive way, engaging in contemplation and meditation. Right? And so think about our words. We use all, <laughs> I love language stuff. Inspiration. You know the word we use it all the time. I was inspired. That was inspirational. Break that word down into its actual literal meaning. The spirit comes in, in spiritual. The word enthusiasm. Oh, I feel so enthusiastic about this project. I feel enthusiastic about my garden. I feel enthusiastic about this dinner party. I feel enthusiastic about the future. The word enthusiasm, in theos, the gods come in. That's the meaning of the word. And so in the ancient mindset, um, th and this is one of the things that Heidegger does that I'm so enamored of, is, is he really, he, he says, look, we will never be like the, they were. We can't be. As you know, human as pro humanity has progressed in a certain way. We can never somehow make ourselves like people of ancient times. But what we can do is try to actually better understand, you know, what they were in themselves instead of projecting our own modern understandings and modern conceptions onto them. And so for them, you know, when a sculptor would get that piece of marble and begin to, to hammer away um, there was often, and I'm sure some people are familiar with this idea, um, the sculptor would feel that he could sense the form that was in the piece of marble already, and that he would interact with that. And they actually, that, all of life in that way for them, you can understand as being sort of infused with a spiritual dimension. Same thing with a carver of wood. Anybody work with wood? You know, the, the, the craftsman encounters their medium and they are receptive to it. And the wood, in a way, kind of directs, not quite dictates, but directs them. You know, oh, look at the way this is. This would make an excellent chair back or, or, or whatever thing is they're going to carve. And so this emphasis on creativity is centrally important. And so this life of contemplation it's the means by which we get to this flourishing. But what does the flourishing look like? It involves creativity, community, and spirituality. Those are the three main things. And this is what I have to emphasize a lot of times with students, because they have this misconception, which in part is the fault of our society, that 
to be a philosophical person or, you know, to be philosophically minded, to, to enjoy deep and meaningful conversations. They think that you've got to have some certain kind of training, you know, or that you had to take a certain class. And, and that's not at all the, the understanding of the ancients. And for them, you know, being philosophically minded or being interested in those things was just part of existence, you know? That, that desire to understand, to, to better grasp and then pursue those things, to have this happier, more fulfilled life. And so the creative component is, is very centrally important. And again, I have heard, you know, people say, oh, I'm not creative. I hear people say stuff like that, you know, they're like, oh, I don't have a creative bone in my body. Which is, a, it's, you know, which is unfortunate that they believe that about themselves. But, even if you think that, if you take some time and, and you know, really genuinely reflect on your life and what you do day to day, I think that you will see that you actually do do things that are creative. Even problem solving can be creative, you know? Um, and, and so, whenever you are, say you're working on something, I and mean, we have so many examples of these instances in our lives um, as just basic human day-to-day -day phenomenon, and it's just funny how we fail to recognize them as such. But you know, say there's some little problem you're trying to solve right there on the fly in that moment, and um, you're thinking, you're thinking, and you might be thinking one thing, but then all of a sudden, the solution is right there. Right, the answer is right there. And a lot of scientists claim that that's how their um, hypotheses come to be. Um, definitely people who have made great discoveries in various fields and in um, of thought and endeavor of, of human interest will claim that, that, that it just came to them in their receptivity. Einstein, certain people we've definitely heard of talk like that, the way in which in their quiet moments, their meditations, their walks, some people meditate and contemplate while they walk. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the great philosopher Immanuel Kant, brilliant, but that is how he did it, and he was punctual. He walked every day at 4 p.m., <laughs> and he walked to the same route, and he even says that when he did that, he tried to be quiet inside, because when he would walk and, you know, be in nature, things would come to him. They would just come in. Ideas. Inspire, inspired thought. And so the creativity piece is central. The other two pieces, though, are, are really kind of, it's all tied up together, because for Aristotle, the whole point of cultivating this, this individual personal happiness is so that you can partake in the polis, in the city, in the society, in the community. None of us exist in isolation, in a vacuum, all alone somewhere. And so this idea of community participation was central. In fact, in Nicomachean Ethics, that book itself, he says at the very beginning, he says, this is political science. I'm doing science of the polis. What does it take to create a good community? And it, what I would say to my students is, really, do you think you could possibly have a good community if the individual members are not good people? It, it's just utterly irrational. If you want to have a good society, you want to have a good community, the lives of the individual members have to be good. They have to have fulfillment and flourishing. And so, you know, the way we, in which we participate with one another is tied in. All of these, none of these things are discrete, if you will, okay? The creativity, the community, and the spirituality, they're not discrete. They're not, you know, oh, I do that on Tuesday from four to five, and it affects no other part of my life. No, it, it's all interwoven, interconnected. Um, but insofar as we're, you know, the way our brains operate, we have to talk about things, we often have to parse them out and separate them and say, okay, point number one, point number two, okay? But they're all interwoven. So, we're all trying to achieve eudaimonia. We're all trying to achieve this good spirit, this good God within. He thinks that's self-evident. He doesn't give an argument for it. He says, and even the things we do that we find difficult or unpleasing, if we're really looking at ourselves, we'll realize we even do those things because we believe they will lead us to the happiness. Right? So somebody gets up at 4 a.m. to go to the gym to work out, and they hate early mornings, and they hate working out. And you're like, why are you doing that? Well, because I believe that I'm going to get in shape. Well, why do you want to get in shape? 
Well, because I'll, I'll have a healthier life, I'll feel better, I'll look good, maybe I can get a mate. <laughs> well, why do, why do those things matter? Well, because those things will make me happy. Every time it's like that. Even the person putting the needle in their arm with the heroin. They're doing that because they believe it is going to make them happy. And so for Aristotle, he thinks that's just obvious. Every single thing people do. Why do you acquire so much stuff? Why do you charge up your credit card? <laughs> you know, you go buy all this stuff and then you like it for a day or two and then it's in the closet and next year it's on the lawn in the yard cell. You do it because you think it's going to make you happy. And it might bring a little pleasure in that moment. Again, we're back to that pleasure thing, you know. But he says, so that's a given, this pursuit of feeling good inwardly, having a good spirit within, is, is just a given. And so it's a matter of looking at, well, what are the means by which we're trying to achieve these things? And which of these means are actually going to get us there? And so, pleasure is pleasure, and it's lovely and wonderful, and there's a place for it, but it's not the way to get there. Because sooner or later, whatever was pleasing you will cease to please you, or the source will be gone. You know, because you're all wrapped up in your mate, you know, especially when you're young. You know, it's just like, oh, I'm so in love. And then, you know, they just, uh, they just, that's all, they're all about each other and nothing else. And then, you know, as it often goes, somebody changes or moves on and the other person is devastated, right? The loss of that and, they, and they, their happiness was not being generated inwardly. Honor as well. You know, a lot of people fall from grace in various ways, sometimes justly so and other times unjustly. But imagine that. But just imagine what it would be like to be someone who had worked really, really hard to, do, to um, garner the esteem of others, the love and appreciation of others, and then make it, you know, make it real extreme and wrongly be accused of something and then suddenly everyone reviles you, you're demonized, your entire life just collapsed. How devastating that would be. And if all of your happiness, your, your eudaimonia, is predicated upon how other people see you, then that's inevitable, Aristotle believes. There's something's going to happen. And then you're going to be let down. And then you're going to be right back where you started. And so he says, you've got to put your focus on the life of contemplation. You've got to put your focus on connecting with the source of your very existence. And moreover, for the ancients, it's the source of all of your talents and gifts. All right? And so this is the notion of the daimonis, which I wanted to just speak a little bit about. I'm very interested in that concept. Um, again, the word eudaimonia, a good spirit within. In our contemporary society, um, most people are familiar with the word demon, which is a Latinized version of a Greek term that's much older. The Greek term is daimones. The Romans called the daimons your genius. That's what that word actually means originally, your genius. That is your personal spirit. However you like to call it. If you're like one of those people who are like, oh, it's my ascended master. Oh, it's my guardian angel. Or, you know, whatever. It's my higher self. That, that's just a bunch of words, and it's not really that important which words we're using. It's the concept. But this idea of that, that which connects you as an individual being to the divine, however you construe it, in whatever way, is your daemon. The plural of daemonia or daemone. And there's a fascinating contemporary thinker who just died not that long ago um, by the name of James Hillman. I don't know if anyone's heard of him. He was a psychoanalyst and uh, well-versed in mythology and th ancient thought. And he has a wonderful book called The Soul's Code in Search of Character and Calling. And he actually utilized the concept of the demonia in his treatment of patients. And one of the things that, to me, I found so fascinating when I read his book was that he uh, said that he always encouraged his patients to try to remember when they were very, very, very young, like three, four, and five years old, and try to remember what were the things that appealed to them at that age. What were the things they loved to pretend? What were the things that they always imagined and saw themselves doing? Because Hillman felt that in his course of treating patients over, like, I think it was like 40 years, that inevitably that's where the daemons showed up, was early life. That when you're little you have um, this uninhibited 
connection to that and you have your little dreams and the things you're drawn to, you know, and the more a person is able to get in touch with that, and you know, if you're five foot two and you always wanted to be an NBA star, probably not going to happen, right? But it might be that you could still pursue involvement with basketball if that's the passion you have, right? Maybe you coach, okay? And so this idea of your, of your demon or your higher power or your, or your higher self or whatever you want to call it, um, it is like a centrally important idea in the thought of the ancients and in certain uh, contemporary psychoanalytic practices as well. Um, and for the ancients, that was that was your that was your connection to the divinity, but it was it was the source of all the things that you're good at. And everyone has talents. Everyone has talents and gifts. Maybe even ones you haven't yet tapped into. But things you're drawn to, things that make you feel good, things that give you pleasure that you could do all alone, and you would and you would derive satisfaction. You know, writing a poem, painting, gardening, cooking. You know, whatever that might be. And, and so that's a, a centrally important idea. And so I, I kind of wanted to wrap up just with that sort of demystifying, that demystification, if you will, of this concept of, of the demonic. Um, and point out that the Latinized version of that word that we know as demon obviously carries a lot of connotations that, that are negative. And you know, we immediately think demon, evil, but for the ancients, for the Greeks, a daemon, there, there's nothing evil. It, it's your connection to the divine. Um, Plato actually says, the daemones are the intermediaries between the gods and human beings because mortals as such cannot have commerce with the divine directly. Okay? And so it's a conduit. That's another way to think about it, a connection. And you know, and I'm... I have a you know, formal study of different religions, and I know that certainly with the idea of when you pray to certain saints, or when you pray to certain ancestors or things like that, that same idea is operating there, this idea of, oh, I need this messenger or this intermediary between me and the divine. And that intermediary is going to help me connect. And, but for the ancients, it was just a given. It was, you know, each of us has a daemon, and it's there from the time you come into existence. And it's this, like if you're good at math, that's why. That's the way the ancients understood it. If you are a person who can pick up a foreign language easily, that's why. And everyone has their individual thing. And so, again, this idea of um, cultivating a life of contemplation where you spend some time in quiet, meditative, receptive modality of being. You know, however you like to do it, walking, staring at a candle, you know, do it, saying a mantra. Or <laughs> there's so many ways people do that. Um, facilitates, if you will, that connectedness that y you can have with, with, this, with this notion of the, of the demon. And better allow you then to express your creativity and thereby enhance and enrich and strengthen those ties to community. Um, because when you're doing what you love, when you're doing something you're truly inspired to do, when you're doing something that, according to the ancients, is demonic, it's from the divine, that is an end in itself. You do it for its own sake. You're not doing it because you're thinking about what am I going to get, or who's going to like me, or what, how's this going to serve me in the long run. You're caught up in that. And I think most human beings know what that feels like to be in that, in that place of just inspired, passionate, creation and doing. And, and moreover, the, the love it generates in you to, towards other people. How you feel more, you're happier. <laughs> That's what it all comes down to. You really are, you're truly happier in that sense of, of your spirit. Your spirit is good and, and you feel open and enriched. Um, I'm used to lecturing for 75 minutes, but they told me to keep it to 50, so. I'm going to have to wrap it up there. Um, I'm going to take questions. If, if anybody has some questions, she said, you know, we'd have a little bit of time for that. So, but first I'll say thank you for being attentive, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.
So he asked, how, how would dreams fit in to this notion of a, the examined life? Um, I do know dreams are mentioned in the ancient texts here and there. I can't claim to be able to tell you right now, oh, here's what the ancients think. But I do know in contemporary um, fields of study, say psychoanalytic, existential, um, and with most people know who Carl Jung is, dreams are tremendously important. Um, and not because we could go pull a book off the shelf that would then you know, be your guide for why your dreams matter, but more dreams operate as just one more tool for self-analysis, just like mythology itself is, is just a set of wonderful archetypes that, you know, when you read about, I don't know if you ever, you know, when you read about Hermes or Aphrodite or the first time you ever read, read about the god Ares or Mars, as the Romans called him, you might have felt this, this resonance with that story. That, that's kind of this idea of the way in which mythology serves in, in self-knowledge in understanding yourself better, and so your dreams could function in that way too. I'm a big dream, I've been recording them for about nine years, and it's, to me it's just, you know, it's just a means by which again to like, think about it and, and ask yourself, huh, what could this mean? What could this symbolize? But it's very individual, as Jung points out as well, it's very individualized. It's not like a certain symbol in her dream would have the same meaning in your dream. But I definitely think it plays a role. I mean. It, how much of a role I think is up to you as an individual, each of us, how much in time we want to invest in it and, and think about it, you know? Good question, though. Well, I, I felt very blessed to teach at Green Mountain College. I've taught at different colleges, big universities in Oklahoma and New Mexico. Green Mountain College is a small environmental liberal arts college, a little under 800 students, and so that just creates a different environment. And, and so I do feel like a lot of what I do um, is more readily um, received by the kind of student that chooses to come there, a lot of them are already just very much in love with nature and, and they spend a lot of time in nature. They are also, you know, pretty hip to trying to limit the amount of media they expose themselves to. I personally have not had a television since 2005. I don't watch television. Um, but those are the kinds of things I encourage with them is just anything that allows them to feel like their heart rate goes down, that they get that calmness, and that they feel receptive. You know, whether it's in a kayak or, you know, some people, they, they work, they have a farm at that college, and, and a lot of people feel that it happens for them with doing simple kinds of farm work. That's the thing, a lot of work is, is meditative, if you allow it to be. Washing dishes can be meditative, folding clothes. But that's what I just, you know, encourage them to do that, and with the creation part, like, you know, paint a picture, write a poem, journal, um, make things with your hands, you know, I think any of those things work well. Yes, well in the, obviously in Latin it becomes a demon, and it's, it's specifically in, through the church. Um, I mean that's just where it happens, in the, in the church itself, and in the reign, if you will, of Christianity from, you know, well 325 is when Constantine, you know, declares the Roman Empire to be Christian, and then we really start getting into the Neoplatonism that, that develops in the, in the medieval time, the Neoplatonic philosophy. And, and in that is where you can kind of track the loss of the daimones as neutral, if you will, in, and it becomes nearly demonic. And I don't think it's because they didn't believe in spirit anymore or spirit. It's just something in language, you know, a, ling a linguistic occurrence when it was pulled out of the Greek and into the Latin, and then it just becomes a demon, and demon carries a purely negative. Well, within the context of, of Christianity, yes, and, and yeah, and the Roman Empire, yeah, yes. Oh, that's a good one. Everything happens for a reason. He's, he's asking about, you know, what do I think about that phrase? Ha. Um, huh. Wow, how much? Well, yeah, I don't want to go on forever, but immediately here's what comes to me. Uh, again, Aristotle. Um, Aristotle has a distinction he makes, which I believe is very handy, between the four kinds of causation, four causes. I don't know if anyone's familiar, but most of us don't talk like that at all. We just cause and effect, cause and effect. You know, I kick you in the shin, your shin hurts. Okay, cause and effect. Um, you fire me, I cry because I can't pay my rent. <laughs> cause and effect. Aristotle, though, on the other hand, said, look, causation is not that simple. 
He breaks it down into what he calls the four types of causes. There's the efficient cause, the material cause, the formal cause, and the final cause. And just real quick, go back to our piece of marble. How does that marble turn into a statue? The efficient cause is that tool in the hand of the sculptor. Okay, banging away, chipping away. The material cause is the, the material itself. That particular statue emerged because, like we said, the, the sculptor might have sensed that there was a feminine form in that marble. The final cause is the reason for which the whole thing was done in the first place, right? This beautiful, say it's Aphrodite, okay? And the formal cause might well have been an idea in the mind of the sculptor where he was like, I'm gonna take this piece of marble and I am going to create something beautiful that will then sit here in the, in the market square and, and remind everyone about beauty. Now, that distinction being made, that causation is not as simple as we would like for it to be, back to your question about what do I think about this idea of everything happens for a reason, I think you can already see that just to assert that everything happens for a reason, in some sense could be said to always be true. Of course that's true, everything happens for a reason. But it's also a way that oversimplifies things. But I actually believe the reason people say that and believe it, and believe me, I've comforted myself with that many times, is, is as something to soothe us. If we feel like there is a final cause to what happens, then we feel better able to bear up under suffering and pressure, if that makes sense. If we believe there's some telos, is the Greek word, the end goal, the thing that's going to be achieved, if we think there's a final cause, if we're like, okay, okay, I suffered for 45 years and this happened and this happened, but in the end it's, it's going to be for the good of my children or the betterment of society or my soul is going to be uplifted, you see, then we're better able to take pain and suffering. And, and so that's you know, what I think the, the way that phrase operates in our society. If, you know, I hope you weren't asking me, do I quote unquote just believe that's true? Because it's just, it's far more complex than that. And I think, again, once you understand the different kinds of causation, that kind can help sort that out a little bit, you know? Um, because, you know, it, those, there are different kinds of causation in any given thing that occurs. Yes, so her question was, um, that, you know, I, I spoke a lot about the ancient and the Greek understanding of contemplation and, you know, what I be able to say something about how that compares or contrasts with an Eastern understanding of contemplation. Um, I have studied formally in grad school a fair amount of Eastern stuff and I appreciate it a great deal and I like it. Um, definitely when I was explaining to you about Heidegger's meditative thinking as a receptivity, the being, very much like an Eastern, very much like this idea of creating no mind. Um, I don't know how many people have ever really tried to engage in an Eastern style meditation where you cease thinking, but it takes discipline and it takes time to develop even to be able to be empty for the shortest span of time. And from my point of view, I think one of the most meaningful things about doing it as an experiment is it better acquaints you with your own mind. You begin to get a sense of how truly, I call it, the neurotic monologue of modernity. It's this never-ending, just endless, complaining and, and fear-driven and, oh my God, this is going to happen and, oh, what if she said that and, oh my God, did I lock the door, the coffee pot, the cats. <laughs> but to engage in Eastern practices, like you can just go and sit with, you know, anybody, any group that's doing that, you can do it on your own. I mean, you know, Google it and read about it. But I think it's very helpful and I do believe that it's definitely the kind of thing Heidegger has in mind when he's talking about meditative thinking, emptying, quieting that, just, just make it quiet so something else can come in. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the practices of Quakers, but I've always found that the, the practice of Quakers when they just go and they sit quiet, that's what, you know, because that's what they're trying to do, is they're trying to empty so something can come in. But yeah, so I think there's a great deal of affinity between those two modalities of contemplation and meditation. Yeah, but um, yeah, there are a lot of helpful techniques for, for you know, trying to just learn how to, to be quiet and to be receptive in that way. Um, and like I said, you know, Google, you could Google that and, and read a lot of things about it, but there's a lot of helpful visualizations 
especially if you're a person who is able to visualize. A lot of people are because they, they do mechanical engineering type work at home. You know, you're building things and most of us have a capacity. If we shut our eyes, we can visualize things. And uh, visualization can be a very helpful technique with, with learning how to focus on your breathing and be quiet and just be quiet and be for a little while. And it's in incredibly invigorating and, yeah, the peacefulness. And, I mean, there's so many positive effects of it. Now, I appreciate all the points you just made, and I actually agree, and obviously we don't have time to go into, like, the wise ifs and all of those things, but um, absolutely. But know thyself, yeah. In fact, you know, because I, that's my area, I mean, the majority of the New Testament ideas are found in the writings of Plato, and that's just the truth. So. Um, I would just chalk that up to those people writing the New Testament, like, you know, knowing good stuff when they read it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and saying, let's, let's incorporate that. So, absolutely. Well, thank you so much again. Thank you.